being in that and sending your kids down there. Well, let's open up the scriptures and let's, uh, let's examine them for a little bit, shall we? Today we're continuing our series called Better Together, and Pastor Ben and I are spending about seven weeks in the letter to the Ephesians. Now, the letter to the Ephesians is a letter written by a guy named Paul. If you've been around the church, you know quite a bit about Paul, or Saint Paul, as sometimes he is known as, and he was a missionary in the Christian church early on. We're talking just a, a few years after Jesus' uh, death and resurrection and his ascension into heaven, Jesus came to Paul and called him to be an apostle, somebody who was sent by God to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul wrote this letter to a church or a group of churches in Ephesus, which is a city, and the surrounding areas. So we're spending seven weeks in this letter, and it's really a cool letter. I don't know if you guys... Uh, know this, so when you're in school for ministry, you have to take a lot of languages. And the New Testament is written in a language called Greek. And so you have to take like two to three semesters of Greek uh, when you're studying for ministry. And Ephesians is actually the book that our professors had us study. So I spent a year and a half of my time in college just digging in deeply into Ephesians. It's one of my favorite letters. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. And so my challenge to you this week, Ephesians is very short. It will take you at most 45 minutes to read it or to listen to it. And so what I want you to do this week is listen to Ephesians or read Ephesians a few times this week because it's really a, a cool book. And what we're diving into here with Ephesians is we're jumping right in the middle of the book. Right in the middle, there's this turning point that we're gonna talk about here in this letter. But before we get in there, I want us to think about something else for a second to kind of introduce this passage. And something has happened in the United States the last 40 years. Now, I turn 30 next month, so I have not been around 40 years, but I can observe what has happened in the past, listening to people and seeing what's going on. Uh, but something has happened the last 40 years in the United States and kind of in the whole Western world. There's been this boom or an explosion of information. So 40 years ago, 1980-ish, how many news stations were there? One. You had one local news station that read the headlines and everyone got their news from one local station. You with me so far? You get into the 1980s and then there's a couple other news stations that start to pop up. As you head into the 90s, there's even more that seem to pop up. There's five or six of these major news stations as we head into the 2000s, there's even more, and now in 2021, there are dozens, dozens of different news stations or news organizations, news outlets that we can get information from. There's been a boom of information from you sitting down with your family in the evening and watching one guy read the headlines for the day to now having dozens of news networks barking information at you 24-7. You with me so far? So in the last 40 years, there's been this explosion of information. Then on top of all this, there's a little thing called the internet that was started back in the mid-90s. Again, I turn 30 next week. I remember not having a home computer in my house. I remember not having internet in my home. I remember when we got internet, when we got dial-up, and I remember when we got fast internet. So in my young life, I went from having no computer in our home to being on Facebook for hours when I was in high school, right? That was the change that happened in my home in those, you know, whatever, 18 short years in between my birth and when I graduated high school. So this little thing called the internet came around, and now there are gigabytes and gigabytes of information right at our fingertips. So not only do we have all these different news networks, news outlets, but also we can get all sorts of information right on our fingertips very quickly. Then on top of all of this, social media has come around, which has allowed people like you and me with zero training, zero expertise, begin to broadcast our ideas and opinions to everybody, right? Are you following me so far? The last 40 years, there's been a lot of change that has happened, and it all has to do with information. Who can get out information? and how much information can get out. 
And now we're in this moment, this cultural moment, where social media, you can share all kinds of information, misinformation, disinformation, and it's difficult to tell what's legit, what isn't, what's true, what's not, and we are just inundated and we are drowning in information. And there's a reason I think this has happened the last 40 years, and I think it's because we as people, and especially kind of as Western people, we really like ideas. We like ideas. We like arguing and debating, and if you are on social media for very long, you know this is the case. We like to argue, we like to debate, and we like to have these fights over ideas. And in fact, now, all the political discourse in our country is all based around ideas. You align yourselves based on ideas to certain political parties, and you believe that your ideas are right, the other ideas are wrong. We all live in this realm of ideas. And we like ideas. We like thinking about ideas. We like arguing about ideas. We like to think that our ideas are right. We are people who like to live in the realm of ideas. In the internet, it's all the realm of ideas, right? When I see a picture of somebody on, on social media, I do not see that person, right? I see the image of that person. I do not get to interact directly with that person when I see their picture. It's the idea of them, but it is not actually them. And so now, the social media, we've actually disconnected and spent less time face-to-face -face with actual people. You follow me so far? The more information we have, the more connected we are online, the less connected we are in face-to-face -face reality. My great-great-aunt, uh, the lady that my mom always called grandma, would tell my mom when she was growing up, mankind's worst invention was the air conditioner. That's what she would say. Mankind's worst invention was the air conditioner. The reason is, she would say, that when people got air conditioners, they stopped sitting outside on their porch in the evenings and started going inside and hiding from their neighbors. Where before air conditioners, everyone was out in the street, you could not, you could not, not talk to your neighbors. And after air conditioners came around, everyone went inside. And then news networks came around, and then the internet came around, and then our cell phones came around, and now we never interact with anybody, unless it's online. You follow me so far? We like ideas, but interacting with individuals, that's much more complicated. That's much more difficult to do. What we're gonna see today in this passage in Ephesians is that God will have nothing to do with this realm of ideas. What we're gonna see today is that God is a God who lives in reality and who works in reality. In the actual, real-life, down-to-earth situations that we're in. That's what we're gonna to see today. And so we start off here in chapter four of the letter to the Ephesians. Paul says this, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He starts off this passage, I therefore, this is a transition word, and you may have heard a preacher, another preacher say this before, and it's a good saying. If you see a therefore in scripture, you have to ask what is that therefore there for, right? So there's a reason that this therefore is there. Paul is making a change, he's making a transition, and so we need to stop and ask what kind of transition is he making? Unfortunately, we in this room have not read the first three chapters of Ephesians before we got to this point. So the first three chapters of Ephesians is this amazing tapestry of Paul writing about what God does in Jesus. It's this amazing three chapters of the Bible where Paul outlines how God works in the person of Jesus. That Jesus has died and is resurrected for us, that our sins are forgiven, and that we are new creatures in Christ. That we are chosen and beloved by God. That's what the first three chapters of Ephesians are all about. Paul then says, therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord. And here we understand what situation Paul is in. This isn't just a nice little metaphor. Paul is actually in prison. He spent much of his time in prison in, under the Roman Empire uh, because he was kind of a rabble rouser. Everywhere he went, uh, there seemed to be these violent uprisings about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He'd enter into a city, he would proclaim the gospel, he would start a church. The people in the community did not like Christians, and there'd be a mob. 
He was stoned. He was thrown out of city gates, doing all sorts of stuff. And because everywhere he went, there seemed to be these mobs, he was imprisoned. So now here Paul is sitting in prison. Now, in this room, please do not raise your hand. I bet that there is very few of us, probably none of us, that have been to prison, right? Probably not many of us, if any of us, have actually been to prison, right? I've been inside of a prison a number of times, visiting with people, but I have never been to prison. Paul here is writing from a very serious situation. And especially at this time, the prisoners were not taken care of by the Roman Empire. So Paul's life was dependent on his family and friends sending him money and sending him goods so that he could buy food, so that he could eat and take care of himself. He was dependent on others to take care of him. Prison is a very very serious situation. Paul here is writing this letter from a very serious, very real human situation. He's imprisoned. And not only is he a prisoner, but he's the prisoner in the Lord. So Paul sees his situation as a prisoner, as being in jail, not as something that God isn't using, but actually as a way that God is enacting his will. Paul is still in the Lord, even though he's in a bad place. He's still in the Lord, even though he's in prison. So we start off this passage with a very real and very serious situation that Paul says God is still at work, even in that situation. He's a prisoner in the Lord. And then he gets down to brass tacks. He says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We just talked about the calling, the first three chapters of Ephesians, that we are loved and we are chosen by God, that we are new creatures in Christ. And Paul says here, I urge you, I beg you to lead a life worthy of this calling. So again, Paul spent the last three chapters talking about all the amazing things God has done in Jesus, but it doesn't take Paul very long before he says, you see all this great stuff that's been happening that I've been talking about, it should directly impact the way that your life is lived. Live your life, or literally walk in a manner, worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That word worthy means equal. That the way that the Ephesians, the way that we ought to be living, ought to be in line, level, with the calling that God has given us. All these great ideas and all these great things that we talk about, God doing in Jesus Christ, ought to have a direct impact on life, on the life that you're living. So now we live our life based on this calling, that we are beloved children of God, and our families are now baptized in this calling as beloved children of God, as new creatures. We ought to be living our lives, leading our families, doing our work, owning our businesses, working in our neighborhoods, loving our neighbors in the name of Jesus based on this calling. You see here that Paul, even though he had all these great things that he was saying for three chapters, he's now saying it needs to directly impact the way that you live your life. God has no patience for living in the realm of ideas. The Holy Spirit leading Paul to write this, he's not gonna let Paul just keep talking about ideas. It's gonna get down to brass tacks. Because of Jesus, this is what happens. We continue on in this passage. Ephesians chapter four, verses two and three says this. Live your lives worthy of calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And here we have Paul, I love this, I love that he does it this way, because you know how we would normally think about this? We would say, lead your lives worthy of the calling to which you haven't called, so you need to shape up, right? You need to stop doing certain things, you need to start doing other things, you need to to get your life in order. That's how we would normally say it. But I love how Paul here says, with humility and with gentleness, with patience, then he says, bearing with one another, in love. Now, I know that some of you people know each other, 
Certainly, if you're sitting with your families, you know each other. And you probably know people that are connected to our church, members of our church. And you know people out in your community. And you know that the problem with people is they stink, right? They're hard to get along with. People are not easy to love. They're not easy to get along with. We are fickle, lazy by our nature. We do not want to do the right thing. We are slow to make selfless choices. We stink. But Paul here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the very first thing he tells the Ephesians, after reminding them to live their lives worthy of the calling, he says, bear with one another. Deal with one another. And as you know, many of you know in this room, if you know each other, if you know me, if you know people in our church and our community, sometimes it, it feels like that. You're just bearing with people. You're just dealing with them. Because they're, they're making you impatient, and they're hard to love, and they're hard to deal with. Sometimes it feels like that's all you can do is just hang on and just bear with them. That's exactly what we're called to do. Paul immediately calls us to each other to love one another. Why? Because God doesn't live in the realm of ideals. God doesn't live in the realm of ideas. He, he, God lives in real life, actual life, and so God calls us to love people, each other. Not the idea of people, not the thought of people, not this nice kumbaya kind of people, but real people. Look around in this room right now. I'm not even joking. Look around. You are called to love the people in this room. The actual people that are sitting next to you, in the rows behind you, in the row in front of you, these people right here, right now, not the idea of them, not the idea of some people out there, but the actual people who are here in this room. The actual people who are connected to our church who aren't in this room right now, you're called to love them too, to bear with them, to serve them. All the other people who are gathering in other churches in this area, all the other Christians in our community, you're called to bear with them as well. Not the idea of them, but with actual them. With the actual people who actually live on your actual streets, those are the people that, call, that Paul has calling us to love, to serve. It's not the idea, but it's the actual, real life, flesh and blood people. Bear with one another. Bear with one another. And maintain the unity of the Spirit. The unity of the Spirit. Again, this is not some highfalutin idea. This is not some kumbaya unity. But this is actual people with differences. Different backgrounds, different languages, different ethnicities, different politics. Unified together in the Spirit. Unified together in peace because of what Jesus has done. Kind of bothersome, isn't it? Like, it would be easier if we could just love the idea of people, right? Like, that would be easier. And I'm telling you, as a pastor, it would be easier just to love the idea of people, right? But well, that's not what we're called to do. We are called to love the actual people who are actually here. This is the frustrating, simple, obnoxious truth, is that God loves actual people who are broken and sinful and difficult to deal with and we're called to love them too. To bear with one another. We continue this passage here. The reason that we do this, the reason that we're part of unity is because there is one body, that's the church, and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. The reason that we are called to unity, to bear with one another, is because God is one. And we confess here that he is three different persons. This is one of the great mysteries of our faith. That one God is in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all with different roles, all with different works that they do, but they are still one God, and just like they are one, so the church is one. 
So we are all different with different backgrounds, different gifts, different roles, but we are in fact one body. Not an idea, but an actuality. That God actually, his ideal for us is that we would be connected in peace and unified in the spirit, working together and serving each other and loving each other and serving our community. That's God's plan. There is no plan B. There is no other ideas that he has. This is it, us, flesh and blood people. And the reason is, is that God likes his stuff. You know, he created everything that we can see and we can't see. He created us out of the dirt. He created it. He likes it. He likes using stuff to enact his will. And so when he sent his son, Jesus, he became flesh and blood. Because Jesus is not an idea. Jesus is not an idea. He is an actual, real-life human man who was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He actually bled real-life human blood on an actual cross, on an actual hill outside of Jerusalem. And because of his death, God actually forgives us of our sins. And Jesus, in his actual human, real-life body, was resurrected, was brought back from the dead, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. And now we all get to look forward to our actual body resurrecting from the dead and living eternally with Jesus Christ. It's not an idea. Thank you. (laughs) That's not an idea. That's real. Jesus is real. He was an actual, he is an actual person. God likes to use his stuff. He likes to use his stuff. And so he still does use his stuff. He uses you and he uses me. Actual, real life people. And so we hear the gospel come to us on the lips of a sinner. You hear it from me, the chief amongst all sinners, that Christ has died for you. You hear it from your parents and from your children, from your neighbors, from the people sitting in the seats next to you, from your spouses and your friends and your family. We remind each other of the forgiveness of our sins. We remind each other of Christ's work because God uses us to do his work. God is above all and through all and in all. He uses his stuff. And we have one hope, the person of Jesus Christ. This isn't just some idea. This is real. We are called to love and serve the flesh and blood people around us in flesh and blood ways. We are called to command, to to proclaim the gospel to them and to demand repentance of them, of their sin. We are called to remind them that Christ died for them and that God has chosen them. This isn't just some idea. It's real. It's as real as Jesus is. So the call from Paul here is that we would be brought together in unity, bearing with one another in Jesus Christ. As real as Jesus is, a real flesh and blood human, so we are called to be unified. So let us be unified. Let us bear with one another now Because God is working a great work in you. Not the idea of you, not some perfect you, but in you, the way you are now. God is doing his work now. He's doing his work in you. He's doing his work in me. He's doing his work in our obnoxious neighbor, in our obnoxious kids, in our obnoxious spouse, in our obnoxious friend that we are in ministry team with. He's doing that work now in us. So let us be bound together. Let's be unified together in Christ Jesus and serve one another well. Let's pray. Well, Lord, I am so grateful that you have called us together. I'm grateful, Lord, for the love that you have for us in Jesus Christ. I'm grateful, Lord, that you have given us such a great gift of being part of your body. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit, that we would know you, that we would love you, that we'd be transformed by you. Lord, help us proclaim the gospel well. Help us serve with our hands and our feet. Help us give gifts, uh, the gift of grace, Lord, to those around us. We'll be careful to give you the honor and glory in all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Lord, we lift up to you all those who are sick from various elements at this time. We lift up to you Dessa Caravan in her rehab, Ernie Little in his cancer, Frida Last in her rehab. Lord, we lift up Danae Jensen in her cancer, Jim Prescott Sr. in his infection, Beth Klein in her COVID-19, and Don and Carol Sisson in their COVID-19. We pray, Lord, that you would give health to these individuals and that you would be with their doctors and nurses who are caring for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up to you, Lord, the continuing COVID-19 crisis, that you would give uh, relief, Lord, to our nation, to our world of this crisis. Lord, we pray that you would continue to heal the sick, um, that you would protect our missionaries who are all over the world and um, interacting with this COVID-19 crisis and the nations they're part of in all different ways. So, Lord, be with them. Give them safety at this time. Be with all of the doctors and nurses and scientists, Lord, who are working so tirelessly to uh, give health to our uh, communities, to our nation, to our world. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would give them wisdom and understanding. Uh, Lord, we know that you do your work through them. So be with them and give them wisdom as they move forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks and praise right now for the birth of Joelle Sherry to Joe and Shanna Snyderbauer. We thank you, Lord, for her health. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with Shanna as she recovers. We pray, Lord, that you would give them um, peace at this time as they readjust to having another child in their home. And Lord, I pray that you would bless Joelle and give her your Holy Spirit. Lord, we also give you thanks and praise for the birth of Grace Elizabeth to Mike and Bailey Schneiderbauer. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Grace and Bailey both as they recover from the birth, and, uh, and Lord, that you would give Grace your Holy Spirit, that you may raise her up to be a woman of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, it's up to you at this time, the passing of, um, of Lloyd Sisson, and we pray that you'd be with the Sisson family at this time. Give them grace. Lord, we also lift up the, the family of Al Freiberg, and that you would be with his family as he has passed away. Lord, I pray that you would give hope at this time to those families, that you would uh, give them your grace and your comfort and your peace. Lord, I pray that they would know you and that they would rest in the promise of resurrection, uh, Lord, at this time. I ask you, Lord, that you would be with them and give them, uh, help them grieve well so they may process this loss and miss their loved ones well. Finally, Lord, we lift up to you the Parker family and the passing of Brock, uh, the tragic passing of this young man. Lord, I pray that you would be with the Parker family and uh, be with our community right now, uh, the community of Rock Falls, the community of Sterling. Uh, Lord, all those who are connected to this family. Um, Lord, in a tragedy like this, our words are few and they're, they seem so fruitless. Um, so Lord, I just pray that you would empower us, the community, to gather around the family and love them and show them support at this time. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would bless the memory of Brock, that you would... Um, welcome him into your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would help the family cling on to the promises of resurrection in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.